Hey, good evening. Hope you're doing okay. Just a quick teaching tonight on uh, peace of mind. I just realized that, uh, well, I haven't just realized, but it's been something that I think the Holy Spirit has been reminding me this week. And that is about how our peace of mind is, is very important in this life, this short life that we've been given. That what are the things that we can cherish and what are the things that we need to defend and protect above all things is our peace of mind. So in, in, um, related to this topic god has just been teaching me through his word how i can i can provide myself with peace of mind uh god has been teaching me basically that i need to meditate on his word i need to meditate on him and that i need to obey his commandments the bible talks about how there, there's no peace for the wicked and what this teaches us is that irrespective of the money that you're able to possess or the money that you have that that will not necessarily provide you with peace and it was a few days ago I was teaching about how we should not trust in riches and how riches are good for a particular purpose. They're good if they're there to help us build the kingdom. They're good if they're there for us to support our family. They're good if, if it ensures that we have more time to serve Jesus Christ. However, riches isn't the most preeminent thing. It's not the most important thing. And from my meditations, from my time getting in the scriptures and just from experiences that I've had in life so far, I've come to understand that the most important thing that with the time that we've been given on the earth is to do the will of the Lord. And the most important thing that, that Jesus Christ instructed the disciples to do was to love him. To, uh, Jesus said that there's two commandments which are important and that these two commandments, that the that the, uh, that the kingdom of God and that the rest of that the law of Moses actually are, are, they rest upon these two commandments and the first commandment was that we should love the Lord with all of our heart and then with all of our mind and with all of our soul I think it's very important there that it, he that Jesus is distinguishing between different things that we need to love him and one of the things that he says that we need to love him is our mind he said we need to love him with our soul we need to love him with our might but we need to love him with our mind and I think the way in which we show God that we love him with our mind is when we we consecrate our mind towards God we, we're always thinking about God in everything that we do or everything that we say we're always asking ourselves what would Jesus think what would God say is God pleased with what I said is God pleased with what I'm thinking there's many times that I I, I could have fallen into temptation but you know what I always say to myself when I'm about to commit that that sin I always say but what is God thinking and I feel the presence of God when I'm asking that question to myself what is God thinking and it's that love and that acknowledgement that God is there, that God is present, that God is watching me, that enables me to overcome that temptation. So money is not something that will guarantee you peace of mind. And I mean, I think one of the, the first things that we need to ask ourselves here is what actually is peace of mind? What, what do we mean by a peace of mind? I think when you have a peace of mind, you're content with your situation. When you have a peace of mind, you're not going out of your way to strive to get something that you don't already have. And money, even with, with the money that you have, money that will not provide you with a peace of mind because once you have money, you want to make more. So people that are the wealthiest in the world, they made a million, they made two million, they made 10 million, but they were not content with that amount of money that they had. And they always wanted more and more and more. I can remember um, a couple of months ago, I was reading, on, uh, reading an article on BBC and it was talking about a man, how he committed fraud uh, with the lottery and he, he he received millions and millions of pounds. And he had an acquaintance who was actually working for Camelot um, uh, or Camelot. And that, you know, we know that Camelot is, is the agency that deals with the lottery in the UK. And he won millions and millions of pounds and he was not willing to share half of that money with the acquaintance. And the acquaintance who was working for Camelot, the inside man, actually killed himself and he blamed it, he wrote a letter and he blamed it on the person that would not split the money equally. And it was only because of the fact that this man was greedy that he eventually got caught because he would have, he would have been free with, with that crime. Nobody had traced it back to him. No one had suspected that he'd committed fraud. They thought it was genuine because what had happened is that the person that was working in Camelot, like he, he played around with the numbers, he played around with the ticket and it was a scam and it paid off. And when I was reading that, I was just thinking, you've already won millions of pounds. Why can't you just split million? I think it was something like maybe let's say if they won four million pounds and he wasn't gonna, he wasn't willing to split it equally. He wasn't willing to to split it two million, two million. He wanted to only give the guy 200,000. And I was just thinking, you've 
isn't millions already enough and this is what i know that we, even with one million if you manage to get one million you're always going to be craving and, and 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 striving to get more and to get more and to get more you've got a bentley now you want a rolls royce you've got a, a four bedroom detached now you want a mansion you're always striving for more and more and there's nothing wrong in in in, in doing better there's nothing wrong in in progressing there's nothing wrong in achieving higher things in your life However, what I want to emphasize is that this is clearly not the priority because the scripture shows us that the first thing that we need to do is to seek the kingdom. The Bible says, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then everything else will be added unto you. Solomon showed us that wisdom is the principal thing. When Solomon had the opportunity to ask anything from God, when he had that dream, that visitation from the Lord, what did he ask God? He said, God, give me an understanding heart. He said, God, give me wisdom so that I can judge your people. And God was really pleased with that request request made by Solomon and as a result God said because of this request that you, you've given me because of the wisdom that you've displayed not only will I give you wisdom that is greater than all of the kings round about you and that is greater than all of the kings that were before you but now I'm going to give you money I'm going to give you riches I'm going to give you honor I'm going to give you the head of your enemies I'm going to give you everything that you need beside the thing that you requested and the same thing the same rationale the same promise I believe is still given to us today if we ask God for wisdom if we make wisdom the most important aspect or the most important priority on the earth then God will give us those riches. And the reason why God will give us those riches is because he can entrust us to use those riches wisely. And he can entrust us to use those riches to actually be a blessing in our community. And he, he can entrust us to use those community, uh, he can entrust us to use those riches to also edify, to build up the church of Jesus Christ. So we need to prove ourselves in the little that God has given us. And God wants us to always know that riches is not the priority. I can remember reading a few days ago from Ecclesiastes 5, verses 10 and it says how he that has silver is not content in silver he's not satisfied with silver and one of the things that i i know from that scripture is that silver is not the only thing in this world that will not make you content you you could be somebody that in the past perhaps you love drugs i i was somebody who used to smoke a lot that did not make me satisfied that did not make me content that made me more sad i used to be somebody who used to enjoy and get satisfaction from sexual immorality that did not satisfy me in fact it made me more depressed there were so many things that i just used to do that was wicked and none of those things satisfied me now however because of the grace of christ i've got to a stage in my life where if i'm having a bad day which we all have bad days if i'm having a tough day if people have annoyed me i don't go and take it out against them i don't necessarily go and start smoking i don't necessarily start in engaging in sexual immorality in the way that I used to before but what I now do is I go home and I read the scriptures and when I read the scriptures when I'm when I'm back in the presence of the almighty God when I'm refreshed by the spirit of Christ then you know what happens I receive a peace which the Bible talks about, which surpasses all understanding. And this peace which surpasses all understanding, it, it can be given unto anybody. I'm telling you that there's a lot of people who are making millions, who are making billions, and they're not satisfied with their life. They're depressed. A lot of them are on antidepressants. A lot of them are, are on cocaine. A lot of them are, are sleeping around with hookers, with prostitutes. We've heard about the things that have been taking place in the last few years in Parliament, how there were so many people who, who, who were MPs, who were culpable of sex trafficking, who were culpable of of, of child trafficking we've been hearing about what's been taking place in the royal family we've been hearing about epstein we've been hearing about all of the other politicians which haven't actually necessarily been named in america who are high up as well some of the some of whom are have, have, have actually vied for presidential campaigns a lot of these people have been linked to what Epstein did. These people are people who are filthy rich. These are multimillionaires and they're not satisfied. And the reason why they're not satisfied is because they haven't put their mind on God. You see, the idea of peace, the idea of satisf satisfaction is a state of mind. And the way in which you can improve your state of mind, the way in which you can, be, you can receive a, a healthy state of mind, is when you put your mind on God, when you put your mind on God, because that your mind is actually the bond that you have with God. Your mind is the bond that you have with God. Your mind is your connection with God. Now, needless to say, we cannot necessarily understand the totality of God. There, there are parts of God that we know. There are certain attributes that we've experienced. There are certain attributes which are revealed in the scriptures. However, we can still 
understand him. We can understand that he is there. We can understand that he is with us. We can understand that he will never leave us, that he will never forsake us. We can understand that he loves us. We can understand that he's guiding us. We can understand that he's working all things together for our good. And these are basic truths which keep us strong in the midst of persecution, which keep us strong in the midst of confusion in the midst of calamity, in the midst of anything that is contrary to what you want in your life, knowing that Jesus is with you, knowing that the Holy Spirit of God is with you will keep your mind strong. Now, I think it was the other day, uh, I think it was yesterday, I was having a, a debate with an atheist and the atheist was was uh, was basically insinuating that my faith was blind. And what I, what I said to him is that if you actually look at the word faith, in the New Testament, we know that the New Testament was written in Greek. If you look at the Greek term for faith, it's it's a term called pistis. And pistis means to be persuaded. So what I was trying to convey to him is that my faith in Christ, my faith that Christ is the Son of God is not blind faith. I haven't been indoctrinated to believe that Christ is the only way. I have not been indoctrinated to believe that God is real, but I have been pistis. I have been persuaded that God is with me and I've been persuaded by experience. And it's that experience that we can have with God on a day-to-day -day basis that will keep us strong. Even when you're confused, even when God doesn't give you the totality of his opinion, God doesn't give you the, the, the totality of his plans. You're not sure what's going to happen tomorrow. You're not even sure what's going to take place today. Knowing that God is with you, having felt the Holy Spirit with you, that is the only way that you can receive peace in this world. Because there is something within us, there, there is a knowledge, there is a, a, a rationality within our soul which understands that everything that we accrue for ourselves, that all of the material possessions that we have for ourselves cannot endure. There's going to come a time where we cannot entertain these things. There's going to come a time where we cannot even possess these things because unfortunately there's going to come a time that we die. We're going to die and every single thing that we've been striving for, working from nine to five, working for decades upon decades, only for a measly five years or 10 years of, of retirement, was it really worth it? And that depression, that sadness is the intelligence that God put within your soul, telling you that you're not living the life to what he had expected you. You're not living your life according to the expectations of God. You're not living your life according to the principles of wisdom, but unfortunately you're succumbing. This is the wisdom within you that God has put within every heart. The wisdom within you telling you that you're succumbing to vanity and that lest you change, lest you turn to Christ, lest you turn to wisdom, lest you obey God and you receive the Holy Ghost and you're led by the Holy Ghost, that every single thing that you do in your life, like Solomon said, will be vanity upon vanities. It really is. And let Let's, let's take that wisdom from a man who was not only the wisest man on the earth, but who was also the wealthiest man on the earth, who said that he had everything, who had everything, who had all the honor, who had all the power, who had, who had absolutely everything to appease the carnal nature. And he said that all of it was vanity upon vanities. He said, let us hear the sum of the conclusion, fear God and keep his commandments, that this is the duty of man. So I want us to understand that the only way that we can have a peace of mind is by meditating on God, by thinking about God, by staying in his word. Now, as I said earlier on, the Holy Spirit will give you peace. If we look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit comes along with peace. Paul said in the book of Romans that the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink, but in peace, in righteousness and joy in the Holy Ghost. So he said it's in peace in the Holy Ghost. So for us to have a peace of mind, it is not through the money, it is through the Holy Ghost. But if we want to have the Holy Ghost operating in our life, we need to obey God. Jesus in, in John 14, 23 said that if you love me, you will keep my words and my father and me will come and dwell within you. And what he was talking about there is the Holy Spirit will come and dwell within you. Peter, when he was preaching, was talking about how the Holy Ghost is given unto anybody who obeys God. In fact, on the day of Pentecost, when they were asking him, uh, thousands and multitudes of Jews were asking Peter when he was preaching, when he was full of the anointing, 
on that day what did he say he said repent and he said turn to christ be baptized in his name and god will give you the gift of the holy spirit so it's that decision and i think i'm starting to become convinced there was a time in in, in the past where i used to believe that repentance was a one-off thing but i'm starting to believe that repentance is something that can be done daily so even if we've transgressed today if we transgressed yesterday the bible says that his mercies are new every morning great is his faithfulness so if we have made a mistake we confess to jesus we confess confess to the father and the holy ghost will continue to renew us the bible says that the outward man perishes day by day but that we, that we are restored that we are renewed by the holy ghost every single day we are renewed by the anointing of god but you know what does repentance mean repentance means to turn to god that means our mind was away from god the bible talks about how we were alienated that means what does alienated mean it means separated we were separated from god by our filthy mind it was our mind which was contrary to god that is why it says that the carnal mind is at enmity with God. But the spiritual mind, the spiritual mind is life and peace. The carnal mind is death. So now that we are in Christ, God has given us his spirit and it makes us spiritually minded. Now we have a desire for knowledge, understanding and wisdom. Now we have a desire for righteousness. Now, instead of taking vengeance upon our enemies, we go to the secret place and we intercede for them. We pray for them. Now, instead of wasting time on Netflix and wasting time on pornography, what do we do? We spend time in the word of God. We read the word of God. We're praying in the spirit. We're praying in tongues. Instead of getting angry before when we were in the world, we knew that God was real. We already knew that God was real, but we used to we used to get angry with God. If things were not working for us, we used to almost feel that we could take vengeance upon God. So we would amount sin upon sin. We would heap sin upon sin, transgression upon transgression. Now, even though whenever we feel a semblance of bitterness within our heart, you know what we do now? We humble ourselves. We go back into the secret place. We begin to worship God. We, get, we begin to praise God. We begin to thank God for everything that he's done for us. Why? Because God has changed our, our nature. God has made us a new creature. God has started to renew our mind. God is transforming our mind with his word and by his spirit. And that is the only way in which we can endure in peace. That is the only way in which we can receive the peace of Jesus Christ. How be it that the apostle Paul was in prison and he said that I've learned to be content in all matters. This word content, this word is similar to the term satisfaction. And yet again, it denotes a state of mind. Paul was in the abundance, the utter bliss of peace that God had provided him, even though he was in prison, even though he had been stoned, even though he was despised, even though he was alienated from his brethren, even though he was disqualified from doing the one thing that he loved most, preaching the gospel and making disciples of men. What did he conclude? He said that I have learnt in whatsoever circumstance to be peaceful. I have learnt in whatsoever circumstance to be content. Why? Because this was a man that was full of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because this is a man that understood that we must meditate on Christ at every given opportunity and that only in doing so will we be able to receive the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. So here in Isaiah chapter 26 uh, verses 3 it says thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. So I think it is notable to, to see here that it says perfect peace. There are different forms of peace. There, there is a temporal peace. Certain types of sins, things of the flesh, they give you a temporal peace. For instance, you're hungry. You're very hungry. You've been fasting for a long time or you just haven't eaten and you eat then that's going to give you a temporal peace. Or you're, you're thirsty, you drink, that will give you a temporal peace. But here Isaiah is talking about a perfect peace, an everlasting peace. And he's saying quite clearly here that the only way that we can receive this perfect peace is if we keep our mind on God, you see. And he says, thou will keep him in perfect peace. Who is he talking about? When he says thou, he's talking about the most high. He's talking about the father. So peace is something that the father gives you. He gives it to you as a reward for you being diligent in his work. He gives it to you as a reward for you consecrating your mind, devoting every single thought unto God. It's possible. It's not impossible. The Bible says that all things are possible with God. So in other words, God gives you the grace to meditate on him. When we were in the world, we did not think about God. We used to think about him from time to time. Maybe every time we were at the church on Sunday. 
Maybe every time somebody mentioned him in a religious studies lesson. But we didn't think about God all the time. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when the Spirit comes into your heart, do you know what's going to happen? You're going to be thinking about God all the time. That's why I, I'm always in the word. I'm always thinking about the word. There are many times I want to do, you know, my flesh wants to do evil. Paul said in Romans that there is, there is a part of me, my carnal nature, that always wants to do evil. And we all have that carnal nature. Sometimes I want to do evil. But you know what? It's because God has changed me. It's because of the grace of Jesus. It's because now he's, his fault is always in my mind. And that is why uh, 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 God through the prophets, and I'll get this up, God through the prophets would, would talk about a time when God would change us. When he would change our, 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 our mindsets, when he would change our hearts. Um, in Ezekiel chapter 11, uh, verses 19, it says, And I will, I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh. Now, a lot of the times in the Old Covenant, when they talk about the heart, if you look at the, the, the meaning of the heart in the Hebrew, what it's talking about is your inner man, right? It's not talking about your, your physical heart. It's not talking about the, the organ that pumps blood to the rest of your body. It's talking about your inner man, your invisible man. And quite often that invisible man, it's in reference to your mind. I mean, I, let me prove it to you in Genesis chapter 6. In the days of Noah, this is the problem that God had with the, with the people that were living on the earth in the days of Noah. Um, Genesis 6 verses 5. And God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, and that, the, the, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So he talks about the thoughts of his heart. So the thoughts of your mind, right? The thoughts of your mind. But what God had promised here through the prophets is that in the new covenant that God was going to give us a new mind. Let me find another scripture about this. Um, I think, let's go to Jeremiah. Well, actually, let's go to let's go to the book of Hebrews. I think it talks about it better in the book of Hebrews. Yeah, exactly. Book book of Hebrews, chapter eight, um, verses ten. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Amen. So, you know, the best way that God speaks to us, God speaks to us for our mind. You know, when you hear a thought, do this, do that, that's God speaking to you. That's your conscience. And God speaks primarily through your conscience. God speaks in a number of ways. God speaks through visions. God speaks through dreams. But if God only spoke to you through dreams, then that means God could only speak to you for about six, seven, eight hours a day. But God wants to speak to us at every part of the day. So the way that the way that God speaks to us is through uh, through our thoughts, through our mind. And that's why it's important to know the word of God, because often as you're walking and you're, you're, you're going about your day to day business, God will then remind you by his scripture what he wants you to do, to do at a particular time. So, for instance, let's say that you were contemplating going to, to a fellowship tonight and you were a bit busy. You had a bit of work to do. You were a bit tired and you really didn't want to go. Your flesh comes in and your flesh tells you don't go there tonight. But then you hear that in your spirit, man, you hear in your mind, basically, that do not forsake the fellowship of the brethren. Who is that speaking there? It's God speaking to you and he's reminding you, go to fellowship. Now, I'm not saying that it's always God because sometimes demons can masquerade as God as well. Demons can use the word of God to get you to do wrong things. And we saw that with Jesus Christ in the wilderness. But what I'm saying is that the more and more we think about God, the more and more we will become sensitive to actually discern the voice of God above the voice of an enemy or above the voice of a thief. So, our mind must be in the word of God. And that's what God told Joshua. And God gave Joshua the ingredient to success. And when I say success, I'm talking about success in everything that you do. Success in relationships, success in, 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 in your job, success in the ministry, success with your relationship with the Most High. 
And God gave Joshua a key ingredient here. In Joshua 1 verses 8, he says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. So God told Joshua, meditate day and night. So that's from the moment you wake up, the first thing you're thinking about is God. The last thing you're thinking about before you go to bed is God. And that is the way that you're going to ensure that you, you stay above sin. And really, the more and more you fall into sin, then the more sad you're going to be, the more depressed you're going to be, especially when you're in this truth, because then you're going to become guilty. And then the enemy, Satan, is going to come and torment you. Best know that depression and a lot of other mental anxiety and mental issues, whilst not only uh, understood by spiritual terms, I believe from my perspective that a lot of mental illnesses can be explained from spiritual terms. And I do believe that there are actual spirits which are designated to torment people's minds. So therefore, what we need to do is we need to have a cover around us. Remember in the book of Job, the first chapter, the first couple of chapters, Satan was saying, was complaining before the Most High and saying that, oh, look, the reason why Job is in a good position and he's always praising you and he never sins is because you put a fence around him. You've put a, a hedge around him. And the reason why he had this hedge around him was because he was a righteous man. He was somebody that was upright. He's somebody that feared the Lord. And he, he offered up sacrifices unto God every single day. Now, this same hedge, this same protection can be placed around us. And the way in which this hedge can be can be understood for me, certainly, is that God can actually literally put a spiritual hedge around you, a spiritual fence around you. But God can also assign angels. He can assign bodyguards around you that will protect you from these evil spirits. Now, remember, Jesus was in the wilderness. There came a time when Satan came and started to torment him. Satan came in his mind. Satan comes. You know, when Satan comes, he comes with a conversation. And what Satan is a spirit. So unless you're very, very spiritual, I don't know about, about you, but unless you're very, very spiritual and you've been fasting for a long, long time, more often than not, you're not going to be able to see angels. You're not going to be able to see Satan. You're not going to be able to see devils and demons. And but on the other hand, whilst you cannot see them, you will definitely be able to hear them. And they speak through your mind. They speak through your mind. Anytime you hear something, you know, this idea that, um, you know, schizophrenia is a real thing. It is a real thing. People, when people have schizophrenia, they're not, a lot of the time, I don't believe they're imagining voices. They are actually hearing voices, but they are more sensitive to the spiritual realm. And if you find, you know, one, one study I can remember reading about is how there's a, there's a strong link between uh, cannabis consumption and schizophrenia. And one thing that I do know is that cannabis as a drug makes you more sensitive to the spiritual realm. So when people are smoking cannabis and, you know, they become addicted to it and they smoke it a lot, what they're doing is that they're opening up their soul into the spiritual realm. And as a result, then they start to hear all of those multitude of voices which are around them anyway, you know. So schizophrenia is a real thing. And schizophrenia can be understood by, by demons. It's demons that are speaking to these people. And it's these demons that are tormenting them. It's these demons that are preventing them from from enjoying the peace that God wants everybody to have. So that is why, again, we need to turn to him. The Bible says if we turn to him, we uh, God will turn to us. In the book of James, chapter 4. James 4, verses 8. Actually, from verses seven, submit yourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So the way in which you resist the devil, again, is in your mind, because Satan, like I said, Satan comes in with a conversation. Satan came to Christ in the wilderness with a conversation. He said, oh, why don't you turn this, this, um, this stones into bread? Satan came to Eve in the garden with a conversation. Oh, why did, did God really say you can't eat this fruit? Satan, when he comes to you, when the devil comes to you, and again, I'm not, you know, when I say Satan, I'm not talking about Satan, you know, himself, you know, <laughs> I, I doubt that Satan comes to, you know, to all of us, you know, but I'm talking about demons. I'm talking about devils that are under Satan. So it says resist the devil. So there are many devils and that could also include people. Jesus called um, Judas a devil as well. So the way that we resist the devils in this world um, that come into our world to steal, kill and destroy, to steal our peace of mind to destroy our, our sanity is we resist him so he comes in with a conversation we rebuke him 
You know, even in our minds, we rebuke him in our minds. We don't always have to rebuke him. You know, we don't have to be on the bus or at our workplace and say, get thee behind me and start shouting because then people are definitely going to think you're mad. But um, you do it in your mind. You know, you can entertain those conversations. You can rebuke him in your mind with the word of God. So it says, when you resist him, he will flee from you. So there will eventually come a time. You know, there's times when you feel depression, you feel anxiety. Those things come and go. The Bible says that Satan came to Jesus in the wilderness and then obviously he was trying to tempt him. But when Jesus Christ resisted him, it said that the, that Satan departed from him and, and, and left for a season. So Satan comes and goes. And then it says angels then came to Jesus and ministered to him. So a lot of the time, your God can permit these spirits to come to attack you, to maybe test you. He wants to test you. Or maybe he wants to refine you. Maybe he wants to get you stronger. Because once you're strong in your mind, then you're going to become very, very strong in every other aspect of your life. You know, where you are today and where you will be in, in, in your future is dependent upon your mind. You know, we understand the saying that mind over material, mind over matter. And I'm somebody that adheres to that position. I do really believe that mind is, is, you know, mind, your mind, your peace of mind is more important than, you know, than, than, than the state of your body. Now, needless to say, there are some things that you can do to abuse your body, which will affect your mind as well. And needless to say, if, you know, if you're, you know, affecting your bad, your body badly and detrimentally, then you won't really be able to enjoy the fullness of your mind because you might die prematurely. So there needs to obviously be a, a healthy balance. However, if you have a, a decent body, if you are looking after your body, then we need to spend more time in your mind in other words if you had to go to the gym or if you had to spend time reading the word and praying which one's more important not going to the gym <laughs> you know you can go to the gym don't get me wrong but what did paul say he says bodily um let me get it up for you actually put, if you're following me as well i'm still going to come back to james but um let me just get this scripture up really quickly first timothy chapter four verses eight for bodily exercise profits little so going to the gym, it profits you, obviously getting bigger, you know, getting stronger, you're looking after your cardiovascular fitness, that, that profits you little. So bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, he, he's a famous bodybuilder and because of, because of, you know, he was so dedicated to bodybuilding, he got that role as Terminator and eventually he even became the governor of California. And this man is filthy rich. And that has profited him. It certainly profited him, the fact that he was looking after his body from a young age. However, if he's not a godly man, there's only, there's only a certain extent to which he can enjoy that profit. Because this is saying that godliness is profitable unto all things, having the life which is, which is now what is that life which is now? That life which is now is the peace of Christ. So there's profit now. That Okay, sorry about that. So someone just, I don't know if you, um, that, that profit is your peace. Having the promise of life that now is and that which is to come. You see, God is going to reward you in the life to come. Can you imagine? You know, I just sometimes I just think, you know, um, how, how peaceful is it going to be in the kingdom of God? You know, I know Jesus uh, you know the kingdom of god is within you i understand that but i'm also talking about when jesus christ comes back how peaceful is it going to be in that time in the new earth when god restores things restores things to how it was in the beginning in the garden of eden how peaceful is it going to be then with satan bound i don't know if we know in the book of revelation it says that when um christ comes back he's going to go straight away he's going to get the false prophet he's going to get the antichrist he's going to throw them into a lake of fire and then an angel is going to come and bound Satan. You see, it's Satan that's stealing your peace. And the way that Satan steals your peace is by indoctrinating you and persuading you to believe that the only way that you can be satisfied in this life is if you live carnally. If you appease this, if you just keep living a life of pleasure, that a life of hedonism, that will not give you peace. That is what Satan convinces you. Satan convinces you to believe, the masses of this world to believe that you can have a great life, a peaceful life without God. That is a lie. But when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to give us peace. In fact, Jesus Christ has already come. And Jesus Christ, when he went on high, he sent his spirit to give us that peace. He sent his spirit to give us that peace. So in James, back to James chapter 4. Um, from verses 8 it says draw near to God and he will draw near to you the way we draw near to God is in our mind 
we draw near to God in our mind, we keep him in our mind, we think about him in our mind. Amen. I think there's a scripture in Malachi. Before I close, I think there's a scripture in Malachi. I'm not too sure. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a scripture, perfect scripture. Malachi chapter 3, verses 16. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard him. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and them that fought upon his name. So God has a book of remembrance for people who think about him. Let us ask ourselves, will we be written in this book? Because God knows our thoughts. God knows our hearts. Let us ask ourselves, if this book is real, which I believe it is, will our names be written in this book? Will God write our names in this book because we think about him? Because ultimately that is what God looks at all the time. God is not sleeping, he's not slumbering. God is always thinking and God is always watching. The Bible says in Proverbs that that, he, that hell and destruction are before the, the, the eyes of the Lord, how much more the hearts of men. So God is always pondering our ways. He's always testing our hearts, he's always testing our minds. And what we need to do is we need to put on the mind of Christ. God said that my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So through the word of God, we become more aware of what God thinks. And then we can adjust our lives to accommodate what God thinks and to, and to live a life of, 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 of Christ-like mentality. That is our priority. And when we live that life like Christ, when we put on his mind through his word, when we obey his word, then what will happen is we will get this peace. And no longer will your peace be in, in a relationship with somebody else. No longer will your peace be on the circumstances that are on the outside. Because we can't afford to let our peace be dependent upon other people. Because people can be with you one day and they can depart. They can leave. That's what the Bible teaches us. Bible te There's many, many stories. David, many people departed from him. David's own son rebelled against him. We thank God in that instance that David's peace was not in man. David's peace was in God. Jesus, all of his disciples departed from him. They were with him one day. They departed from him the next day. If you put your peace in somebody else, then you will not have a secure foundation of peace. You only have temporal peace. Your, your peace will only be there when they're doing something you like. If you put your peace in money, then as I said earlier on, you will not get peace because the very nature of money is that once you have it, you want more, you crave more, you crave more. It's insatiable. You know, there's an unlimited amount of money that you could potentially receive. So it's insatiable. The same thing applies to anything of the flesh. So the only thing that's secure is God. And God supernaturally gives us peace. God is peace. God understands what peace is. These notions of happiness, God, uh, these, notions, these concepts rather of happiness, of peace, of anger, they all come from God. <laughs> you know, they all come from God. God has emotions as well. Right, we were made in his image and in his likeness so we we have these emotions because they are emotions which god has right so if we want to have the totality of happiness the totality of peace all of these things the totality of love then whilst we can have our own impure form of it god can give us a pure form of it god can give us an everlasting and a perfect form of it that is what jesus had jesus was the fullness of god bodily he's a, the fullness of the godhead bodily he had all of god's attributes in his body and god actually promises to give us those things as well because christ said if you believe in me you'll do my works and greater so i think we need to keep thinking on god we need to keep obeying god we need to keep in the word of god we need to keep going to fellowship do not depart from relationships i may have said earlier on that you can't rely upon relationships to give you peace but relationships are important in maintaining your peace of mind as well i'm not going to go to one extreme and say that relationships are not important they definitely are important that's why god said it's not good for man to be alone and that's why god encourages us to have fellowship he says when two or three are there i'm there in the midst of them so god certainly encourages us to have fellowship and relationships are integral to having a good state of mind 
you could, there's some people who have millions and billions and they don't have any family and I'm sure that they're not feeling as good they don't have a, as good as a state of mind as people who don't make that much money but that have a good community around them that's what happened in the early church it said that everybody that had money and lands they sold it and then they gave it over to the apostles feet and that these people were full of joy and full of peace because they had good community and the holy spirit was there with them so that i think is more valuable than money peace of mind is more valuable of money so let us keep our minds on god and if we do fall which we will fall then confess our sins god is faithful god will give you mercy definitely he will always give you mercy if you fall if you repent you turn to him and he will restore your peace now and forevermore amen god bless you all thank you if you haven't already please share and um by god's grace i'll be back again um talking about the mind because the mind god is keep god keeps teaching me this last week that the enemy attacks through your mind that you please god through your mind that you can have peace of god through your mind that a lot of it has to do with your mind God bless you.